Dark Ozarks. We are taking a deep dive into cryptids tonight and not just Bigfoot. Sorry, big guy. The Dark Ozarks podcast is now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, or about any other podcast platform. So cryptid discussions always seem to go either down the folklore trail entirely or straight into naysaying witnesses. So let's not rehash that. Well, how about the science versus lore? Where does it line up or not? But first, we want to invite everyone to like, follow, etc. Dark Ozarks <clears throat> on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Plus, we encourage you to follow the podcast. While you are over on Facebook, you can subscribe to the private Dark Ozark subscriber group. Why, you may ask? Yes, it does have a small subscription fee, but you receive exclusive content and behind the scenes information that is found nowhere else. It also helps us bring more original content to the Dark Ozarks. You can click the subscribe button on the page. And remember, you will have to log in since there is a payment aspect. We appreciate everyone. And now you can get Dark Ozarks t-shirts for sale at darkozarks.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. We do encourage everyone to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online on Facebook, and their website, alwaysbuyingbooks.com, for all of your reading needs, including a large section on the paranormal, history, and more. Not to mention, the building is haunted. Be sure to tell Bob and Elise that we sent you. We also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only, only English style brewery in Missouri and twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and food in a historical building with a very noir past. And yes, it is haunted too. Tell Nate and Tiff we sent you. Oh, absolutely. Love those guys. Love all those places. And oh, yes. <laughs> This is a really interesting topic, cryptozoology. First of all, there's still a lot of people who may be unfamiliar with the term cryptozoology. Uh, True. <clears throat> and, and then, of course, the shortened term cryptid, essentially meaning mm, animal out of place or animal that might not exist, but some people have seen it. Exactly. Basically, a <laughs> mystery animal um of some sort either because it's in an odd place or we we don't know why it is or it's been misidentified uh, <clears throat> and some people whether people are familiar with the term cryptozoology or not they are familiar with cryptids the two most well-known are the log nest monster and bigfoot Yes, yes. And, and probably the two that are talked about the most and for the longest period of time overall. Uh, but there's a, there's a lot more, including in the Ozarks region, which we'll yes. get to. I think, why don't we start a little bit, just an overview of sort of when we're talking about the science versus the lore, science mean, what, what, what do we really know? And what what makes logical sense yes um, and i think probably a good example would be the patterson gim uh gimlin film yes you kind of go over don't you think <clears throat> i think so and of course this is a, a whether again is as, as many things in association with especially better known cryptids go the majority of uh, of people are are familiar with these things even if they don't know that they're familiar with these things and mm -hmm. the the patterson gimlin film which was alleged to have been recorded on october 20th 1967 <clears throat> is the extremely well-known extremely famous video footage of Bigfoot walking in uh, the forest. Yes, through uh, <coughs> through a dry creek bed, um, yeah. um, clearing in the forest. And um, 
it's still debated to this day. Uh, what's what I do find very interesting about it, and what the compelling aspect of it is that a lot a lot of scientists, anthropologists, experts in anatomy and movement have said that this is not a human. It's not proportioned like a human. The muscular um, system is not human, but yet it looks um, organic. It does not look like a suit of some sort. And um, that, um, and it's very clear, uh, caught very clearly. Um, on the other hand, there are those who say, no, it's a hoax. Right. <clears throat> and I think that the, mm, <clears throat> the, the, the forces behind the two opposing viewpoints <clears throat> in terms of it being real footage of a, of a cryptid, real footage of Bigfoot, is that uh, a number of individuals who are well-versed in analyzing animal movement versus human movement have genuinely gone on record to say that this does not move like a human or does not move in a way that a human could fake. Exactly, exactly. And, um, and actually, I've se I, I have seen footage of them trying to recreate the movements um, using a, a world-class sprinter and it were and they were unable to do so. So um, it is very compelling. Uh, the flip side, one argument against it is basically who who filmed it? Yes. And Roger Patterson being the man who filmed it <clears throat> was documentably mm, obsessed with Bigfoot. Uh, he had years and years of being on record for having been obsessed with uh with bigfoot and he was essentially using bigfoot or the idea of bigfoot to make money and then suddenly he comes up with video and the best the best video ever found yes well and he had written a book the previous just one year earlier document documenting a um sighting that was several years old out of Canada, which mirrors the film very closely and including uh, dis detailed descriptions of the creature by witnesses that match, again, what's, what's on film. So some people say that's an indication that it's a hoax and that he that he somehow created a suit that matched this you know this account that he had already published about um whereas again uh, could it be that there were two similar creatures and it is difficult to parse out and i think one of the things that you you rapidly get to with cryptozoology is the camps of um, Mulder versus Scully. Do you want to believe versus do you <clears throat> um, think, and, and I think oftentimes with the individuals who don't believe, it is more of a question of, I'm not opposed to believing, but it is too, I, I refuse to be gullible. I refuse to not be a skeptic. Right, right. And, and, I, and I get that. Uh, another aspect of this that people point to is that Patterson, um, because he had been looking, the fact that he had been looking for Bigfoot is a strike against credibility, yes. which, which also means anytime anyone is in, in pursuit of a mysterious subject or something that's not proven, you have to be careful. So we've been known to we've been known to investigate the paranormal. So 
Does that mean any any evidence we catch is suspect? <laughs> is <clears throat> and that's it's also it on one hand you can see it as a strike against credibility in the essence that oh my gosh he wants this so badly or he needs this to further his book deal or whatever right but on the other hand who better to collect the best evidence than someone who has been searching for it his entire life has dedicated his life to it that's right and who's more and if we want to talk about facts and science statistically who is more likely to come across something unusual the person who is um, wandering through a place you know one time or someone who is methodically you hope looking for that subject <clears throat> and the idea that you know, as a as a is a real life um, analog, you know, the <clears throat> the deer hunter who gets up at four in the morning and goes out morning after morning after morning during deer deer season and finally gets a buck. We don't question the fact that luck had very little to do with it. That that's true. That's true. Um, so it, it, but it is difficult because we just, we still don't know. Right. It's, yeah. it's, I think it's frustrating more than, <laughs> I think in some ways. <laughs> yes. And, and I think on the, on the, uh, on the skeptic side with, with these kind of issues that you have um just the <clears throat> the idea that as as modernity has encroached upon wild lands that mm -hmm. as the world has gotten smaller uh, it's harder and harder to believe that a larger or sustainable populations of these really particularly because something you rarely get a cryptid uh, report about something really small. Typically, cryptids are larger than life. True, most most of them are, and most of them do tend to be that way. Uh, <clears throat> now, on the other hand, there are lots of remote spaces that we don't tend to think about, including in the Ozarks, um, with national forests and um different riverways that are not navigable mm -hmm. um and not to mention in other parts of the country as well um, and, and it is a, a an aspect <clears throat> to to sit in an office or to sit in suburbia and condescend over the idea that there couldn't be any space for populations of unknown animals to exist, say for example in North America or elsewhere, still has a ring of arrogance to it. It does, um, and it it it, it smacks of telling oneself that I I own the domain of my existence, <laughs> and, yes. and, and nothing can touch it. And it, it mm, is only peripherally associated. <clears throat> but I remember reading a report in the late 19th century that there was a petition to close the patent office. Yes. Because uh, a, a group of individuals had decided that by say about 1890, everything that could conceivably have been invented had already been invented there was no reason to continue the patent office because we had already reached the apex of our technology. Exactly. And this is before airplanes and modern vehicles and space travel and everything else, computers and everything else. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe we, maybe we should close it now. <laughs> right, right. We, we have arrived. 
<laughs> Somehow I doubt it. I but, I do too. But it is um, something that is is an interesting reference point just in regards and we'll we we have a lot of cryptids to go through um mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're leading off with uh, a bit of bigfoot but not limiting to bigfoot but i did find this very interesting in the science behind cryptid sightings with sophie bushwick and darren nash that it was it was a reference to just the the attributes of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Momo, Buck Monster, Yeti, this, this genre <clears throat> that we're talking about a human shaped creature who is able to live in environments where we know we can't survive due to extremities of cold, the elements, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a creature that is incredibly vocal, able to use possibly infrasound as well as long distance um howls and there's claims that that bigfoot is a a tool user a tool maker is very good at throwing things is basically a superhuman creature who is also truly predatory and could be actually responsible for human disappearances which is an aspect that we don't typically attribute to bigfoot it's true, but it you know it could give another spin on the four one one missing <laughs> persons. Um, but you know, all those things that you mentioned, there are there are examples, in fact, that um, would support the possibility. For instance, surviving in cold extremities, etc. Neanderthals did. Um, yes. And uh, modern humans did during the, the last ice age as well. So we might not be very comfortable and we might have to adjust, but you know, it has been done. And I think that's one thing a lot of people forget. Um, the vocalizations, you know, there are other animals that do similar things, including primates um we just tend to humans just tend to be rather weak in that regard um infrasound is is something that is uh used by a number of animals actually um uh, elephants for one um so you know tool tool user tool maker chimpanzees other uh uh some gorillas other monkeys have been known to use objects as tools. Um, in fact, I re I've read a report not too many months ago that uh, they had uh, observed, um, I'm pretty sure it was chimpanzees actually uh, fashioning tools, carving sticks. So, I mean, again, it's definitely, definitely plausible and there are examples. Uh, predatory, you know, you know, that that doesn't necessarily surprise me. I mean, um, we still have a lot of people that go missing that we can't explain. Very true. And I, and I think that's another thing that people don't think about these days. They, they seem to think that there's always an answer. Yes. And th there are a lot of cases where there are missing people that have never been found um, without a trace. Uh, and that still occurs. Uh, so who knows? So while, is, you know, I mean, it's easy to, it is easy, easy to naysay, oh, all these things that, you know, something couldn't really do that. But there are examples of all of those items. There are, and it it again is that is that shift away from sort of the the perception. I, for me, I think a, a just an interesting aspect of this is Bigfoot is a dangerous apex predator. 
because that is a shift away from a lot of pop culture. It is, it is. And it does seem to line up with certain accounts in certain parts of the country more than others. Um, the, the Pacific uh, Northwest does not seem to, uh, accounts do not seem to really uh, talk, modern accounts don't seem to talk about aggressiveness too much. Although there are uh, Native American uh, lore of the wild men where not only were they aggressive, but that they fought wars with the Indians, uh, with the natives in years past. So um, who is, who, who's not to say, um, some of the accounts, particularly in the Southeast and Florida and Georgia and so forth, uh, often talk about aggress aggressive behavior. So oh, maybe the heat drives them nuts, I don't know. It, it, it would mean, um, it, would it mean has, <laughs> but another, another aspect that I found really interesting in this particular article was it referenced Bigfoot as the gateway cryptid? Yes, yes. And, and, and I think that there is a bit of a fair statement there is one, um, it, it, it gets interest in other things, but this notion that if you're a Bigfoot believer, suddenly you you are uh, other things that uh, come into play is more recent, and specifically the idea that of putting supernatural connotations under this, or UFOs and ET being involved with with uh, Bigfoot. Uh, and again, it's that seems to be an internet age idea. Yes. <clears throat> and it, it, the, the UFO Bigfoot connection is comparatively quite recent. Yeah, I, to be honest, I, I really didn't hear too much of that until really probably five or six years ago. And um, it just seems to kind of morph. I think some people are trying so hard for explanations and without saying they're trying to come up with a unified stream theory of the paranormal. <laughs> yes, yes. And <clears throat> which from a, from a sociological science standpoint is important to take into consideration with the human mind because the human mind wants to make sense of things that don't make sense. That's true. We, and, and we love our low, low boxes. Yes, and the idea of looking for patterns and attempting to attach um, phenomena with patterns. And he's right, we do tend to try to, oh, there you are. Yes. Um, <laughs> Speaking of patterns. <laughs> But just, you know, the, the desire to, to associate and make sense out of things that are perplexing. And, That's true. And I think the human mind does that, not just with the potential of the paranormal or cryptozoology or the unknown, but just anything that's out of place. If, it, if we find it perplexing, we try to put it into order, uh, often unconsciously. And so it, to some degree... It, it can't help but follow certain logical progressions of attempting to put things with things. Very true, very true. All this being said, when we talk about the Ozarks in Bigfoot, um, there are a couple of big names. Yes, uh, yes. Um, the, the most well-known from Missouri is the Momo. Yes. And um, it's, it's an interesting case study if, when you want to look at it from the empirical side. Um, uh, and it's a little interesting from the folklore standpoint, too, because it doesn't quite 
check all the boxes either. So and that is very true. And it's in short now it, to me, uh, an aspect of the Momo <clears throat> is the Momo is actually quite well known regionally mm -hmm. uh, and gets tossed about the the term it gets tossed about it may even get tossed about an urban legend particularly online enough that the name in some cases may no longer be associated with uh bigfoot quote unquote that's true that it, it sometimes um when you encounter particularly more on the urban legend kind of side of things, it's it's this sort of ephemeral, vague, fits all kinds of monsters or any kind of monster you want kind of uh, explanation. But um, Momo um, is short for Missouri monster, uh, not, not exactly, you know, exciting name but um we were talking earlier and i think you had the good you you had the explanation for that <clears throat> i am um, well one of the things my brain was off on we'll come back to that in a second <laughs> but the the term momo monster is quite repetitive since that would be the missouri monster monster <laughs> that's true well you know alliteration at least you remember it you do and it <clears throat> is just this but to, to to actually dig in there are two specific reports uh 1972 71 and 72 i believe that <clears throat> it, around louisiana missouri which is mm -hmm. north of the ozarks but not by a whole lot right and <clears throat> that is is really where this came about that this animal was purportedly sighted or creature was sighted and it is a bigfoot like creature it was seen twice and it made it into the newspapers and in so many cases <clears throat> newspaper headlines in the 20th century ultimately ended up defining the the names of these cryptids even well before the term cryptozoology was coined. That's true. I mean, that's true. And so um, Momo was eye catching, I'm sure, as a headline and, and didn't take a lot of ink. So um, that's probably how it happened. But the initial um, sighting is interesting uh, for several reasons when you look at it as far as what makes what, what makes sense and is this a credible story? Um, it, it's on the outskirts of town. Uh, I've actually seen documentaries um, where they, they show the location and everything. It, it really is fairly rural, uh, no, no real close houses nearby, uh, large yard, you see tree line, that kind of thing. And the parents are not home. A uh, teenage uh, sister, uh, Doris, is um, watching her younger brothers. And I think they're playing in the yard and she's inside and, and she hears them scream, um, goes at, and looks out the window and notes a note, it's the bathroom window, which, I don't know. There, 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 there's something about bathroom windows and 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 uh, Ozark's um, cryptids, but um, oh, Falcon Monster really just wanted TP. That's right. <laughs> but we'll get to that. Um, <coughs> and, um, and what she sees is a huge black, hairy, man-like creature standing by a tree huge hands cl clutching the corpse of a dog. Yes. Um, um, and um, not much of a neck, the head, the head was big and round, described almost like a pumpkin. Um, and so you have something that apparently is predatory, um, hulking, definitely lets out of place. Um, 
I guess someone could, you could say perhaps a bear, but that seems a little odd. It does. Uh, you know, um, at the edge of the, at the edge of the yard, although not, you know, unknown to happen. Um, and so it's easy to dismiss by saying, you know, these were, you know, a teenager and young boys and they were, uh, their imagination got away from them or, uh, it, their their reactions were out of proportion to the the circumstances because they were alone and it was kind of, you know they were not near neighbors that kind of thing but um it does seem that there there's enough detail that they saw something that certainly did not add up right and, and you <clears throat> still have to explain the dog right you do uh, i just feel bad for the dog actually yeah me too <laughs> something that is particularly <laughs> of interest with these this report and the other report associated with quote-unquote momo is that unlike some other reports of bigfoot it as we mentioned <clears throat> does appear to be pretty aggressive yes and there is a, an aspect associated with it of danger mm -hmm. that is Mm, a little less of the Harry and the Hendersons peace, love, and harmony with the uh, with the New Age culture. Yeah, uh, sociological aspects. The idea that we're dealing with a, in essence, potentially hyper intelligent uh, apex predator who is as good at what we do, if not better, mm -hmm. than we are, and. <clears throat> But coming around, we're dealing with, in this first report, we're dealing with an eyewitness accounts that are composed entirely of, of children and or uh, teenagers. Mm -hmm. What in your experience with, uh, with witnesses <laughs> do, does this, this tell you? Well... The younger the witness, the, the, the harder it is to um, be assured that there's no exaggeration uh, or that they, you know, uh, are uh, relaying what objectively happened, not even that they're trying, trying to make something up or hide details. Um, and then there's the there's the factor of when you have multiple witnesses and it's just them how much did one of them affect the other's versions um yeah. that that can be an issue um you know courts tend to shy away from child witnesses for these reasons you know if at all possible i mean sometimes the, there isn't a choice but um the, it always leaves some questions um and on the other hand there are young fairly young witnesses that can be pretty reliable but it, it has you know a lot of it has to do with that individual how mature they are how objective they are how observant they are um and kids are so different it's hard it's hard to know so um just based on the accounts you know it, it does seem like something odd happened exactly what i don't know um was it a neighbor in a ghillie suit playing a joke i don't know um you know, um, I, I wouldn't want to win a case on it. Let's just say that. I think that's fair. I, uh, the, just in terms of the potential aggression, aggressiveness, the aggression that's reported with Momo, uh, the mm -hmm. only other Louisiana, Missouri account that we have on file, it comes from the following year. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it is reported to be 
uh, a couple adults who are traveling from West Virginia, passing through Missouri. It is presumed that they are unaware of the Momo legend. Mm. <clears throat> they um, <clears throat> stop in the uh, Logan Conservation Area. And first off, they report uh, smelling something that smells like skunks. And this is a common uh, association with Bigfoot creatures. Yeah. Yes, a very musky smell. <clears throat> and they look around. Um, they see the Momo. And in both of these, in this particular report uh, from the Lincoln newsnow.com <clears throat> original article in both cases he's described as having a large pumpkin shaped head which i think is is a little rude uh, rather <laughs> rude way to describe our uh, our friend the momo and uh, he also has glowing eyes which is an interesting aspect because both of these reports uh, appear to have occurred during the daytime when you they would not have been mm -hmm. shining a light in his eyes to have a reflection, but it still reports glowing eyes. Um, quote, nearly seven feet tall, had to weigh, had to weigh, quote unquote, 400 pounds. And in this case, he runs at them uh, mm -hmm. and they run and get in their car. Fair, I think I would too. Uh, yeah, I would. <laughs> um, now, I think it is, it's worth noting too, though, that, um, you know, that kind of aggressive behavior, if anything, is more uh, a common factor of Bigfoot type creatures in the Ozarks. Yes. The, the belt monster or um, in Arkansas um, is known to, has been known to be aggressive, has, um, reportedly killed uh, hogs on a farm, things like that. Um, the blue man of Southern Missouri, Northern Arkansas, uh, with sightings going back to the 1860s was very aggressive, uh, charging at loggers and uh, throwing rocks and, and uh, using stets as um, like, like a club. Um, the Arkansas wild man with reports going back to the 1830s um, uh, was reported seeing um, chasing men, uh, actually trying to run, uh, run witnesses down. And so uh, the, the aggressiveness actually is, you know, made sense with the other kinds of creatures that are reported in the region. It does. <clears throat> but again, I think an interesting shift away from the, the popular idea or the idea of more popular culture, which is. <clears throat> right. And the the one thing that I was curious about, and you've studied this more than I have, the the first report <clears throat> just outside of Louisiana, Missouri, references Marzolf Hill, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is this a large um, a wooded hill? Is it a, a a notable something notable in the landscape? I'm just I was I did not have time to dig into that. Yeah, from from photos and in in uh, short clips of video that I have seen at different times, I mean it, it's a decent sized hill, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's enormous or something that is you know a landmark for miles around necessarily. But it's um, it is it is a noticeable hill. <clears throat> it reminds me a little just in concept, of course, in some of the flat spaces between, for example, Springfield, Illinois, and uh, Bloomington Normal, mm -hmm. uh, or, mm, you know, along <clears throat> I-55. Yeah. There are occasionally 
uh, geological oddities of large wooded hills that stand mm -hmm. uh, apart from what was originally tall grass prairie is today farmland mm -hmm. and <clears throat> for me my mind begins to make connections with those as having significance to mm -hmm. to certain things uh particularly things possibly that are unusual and then i can't help but draw a points of comparison with crowley's ridge yeah I, I think that's I think that's fair. I, I think this hill, you know, certainly is not as big as some of those that are along I-55 or, or and certainly not Crowley's Ridge. But um, I, I think it 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 it's it looks distinctive enough that I'm sure it was a local landmark. You know, probably especially in in a horse and wagon days. You know, of marking where you're going. You know, getting past that. So. Um, one of those things I'm sure everyone in that vicinity knows where you're talking about type thing. <clears throat> and it does stand to reason that particularly wooded or geographical, geographical locations <clears throat> that, um, that your, your cryptid could go hide in and have food sources could potentially stand out. That's true. That's true. And I think um, I think something that a lot of people don't think about these days either is that we, we get a lot of reports anymore that do put Bigfoot sightings close to quote civilization, close to town. Um, and um, and it may just be a wooded area that is, you know, say, you know, 100 acres or something um, where there are multiple reports over time of seeing something. Um, we've gotten reports of sightings along railroad tracks, particularly in um, areas where um, kind of between towns and uh, areas where there aren't necessarily a road right there um yeah. which to me may would be a common sense migration practice at this point it would be an easy easy track not likely to run into as many people that kind of thing so um we, we may have more uh, of these things happening, you know, on the edge of towns and not realizing it than a lot of people think too. And as much as we may not like it to think about it, a lot of the reasons that cryptids may have remained unseen is simply because human beings aren't particularly observant and we're not paying any attention as a general rule. <laughs> That's true. And if if they if they are um, out and about a lot at night, we tend not to be as much. Right. And and that does seem to be <clears throat> something that is reasonably consistent with cryptozoology, uh, not across the board, but in many cases, the reports are of animals that are being reported as nocturnal yeah well and and again a lot of the you know sort of the theories are that they are avoiding human contact so they probably learn to work around our patterns <laughs> <clears throat> or at the very least we're dealing with <clears throat> creatures that exist in some way <clears throat> in some way in some medium that mm -hmm. is difficult for us to readily access, whether that be the night, whether that be the sky, whether that be the woods, or in some cases, that might just be the water. Exactly, and that might be a good um, place to start talking about river monsters. Well, we have a few. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I, I, this was interesting to me. I was um, 
I was surprised by part of this, to be honest. And what part was that? Um, the Missouri River monster, particularly. I I had no idea. <laughs> <clears throat> that one that one was really fascinating to me. Uh, it's in association with North Dakota. It is a comparatively little known uh, Missouri monster, uh, referenced as the uh, Mini Washitu. <clears throat> And as, as we will see with uh, a handful of cryptids that I suspect we'll have time to discuss tonight, there is a, an odd metaphysical quality to this monster. Mm -hmm. that, that is a thing uh, with a lot of these. And <clears throat> the, the particular reference just to dig right into it, is mm -hmm. that uh, the mini Washitu, <clears throat> when it is seen, is seen within the waters of the middle of the river. It causes a redness shining like the redness of fire as it passes upstream against the current with a terrific roaring sound. And anyone who saw it would thereafter become crazy and ultimately die that that's the part that really fascinated me um because mo most of these tales and in river monsters or lake monsters generally don't seem to have an effect on witnesses some sort of physical effect right <coughs> and it's and covered in case, covered in hair too yes like a buffalo but red so mm -hmm red in color in terms of the hair but then also this this pulsing red light associated essentially rudolph from hell <laughs> it, it does kind of sound that way when you think it's it's covered in fur and yeah. it has a horn yeah and it's red and it's uh, red and <laughs> maybe I may have nightmares about Rudolph now. So <laughs> <clears throat> I may as well. It uh, a single horn, uh, backbone standing out notched and jagged like an enormous saw. And <clears throat> that that also that it would move upstream against the current and break up the ice uh, after as as winter uh was was concluding and you know s maintaining our our thread on science i'm real i really can't think of anything that would explain that um, not all of those pieces no even even the seeing something you know red or glowing um in the middle of the river i'm not you know in the ocean you might have an algae bloom that's red but yeah uh, but uh, in the upper missouri river that's harder to <coughs> reference it yeah. did remind me one of the early if not the early steamboat that was not terribly successful on the missouri river was yeah. dressed out like a dragon in order, theoretically, mm -hmm. anyway, to inspire awe among the natives. And uh, according to local accounts, it inspired mockery instead. <laughs> <clears throat> Look at that silly thing. <laughs> uh, less <laughs> less uh, shock and awe than previously uh, organized but the it made a bigger <coughs> impression in st louis yes <laughs> they would have had more success if they just brought ooey gooey butter cake yeah that's probably true yeah it would have worked on me but <laughs> some of the references the folkloric references of the dragon boat that was used is not dissimilar from the mini washer lore 
Mm. So I guess the question is, which is the chicken and the egg? Did the did the legend exist before the the steamboat? <laughs> I, I'm I'm going I'm going to go out on a limb and conjecture that it did exist prior to the steamboat. That they were drawing from what possibly may have been a rather consistent folkloric uh, mm -hmm. tale that is associated not just with the North Dakota portion of the Missouri River, but possibly much of the Missouri River. Yeah, that, that would make sense to me as well. Um, I have to admit, I think it's probably the most interesting river monster story I've heard to date, so. Especially the, for me, the, the metaphysical qualities, as you noted, of impacting those who see it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the sense of, of uh, it being a harbinger of doom in this yeah. regard. <clears throat> and that does bring an interesting take on encrypteds and the idea that in modern society, a number of people, potentially us included, are going out of our way to try to see cryptids mm -hmm. and that earlier lore associated with these monsters in in some cases was was the idea that <clears throat> you go out of your way not to see them that's true even in in native lore um these wild men stories typically were cautionary tales that you stayed away from them, that there had been wars in various parts of the country, um, and that sometimes uh, members of the tribe would disappear and were blamed on the wild men. So, um, yeah, I, I I agree with you there. That. It, uh, oh, go ahead. No, I, that that <clears throat> that uh, what what for hundreds of years maybe thousands of years uh, you know people said no no <laughs> just leave that alone <laughs> now people are actively going out and trying to get up close and in touch <clears throat> which could be a bad idea um also i think it really speaks to <clears throat> the separation of cultures and in perhaps a an approach what tend to be what i'm what i'm seeing here is that one culture has a tendency to uh venerate but at the same time hold space and in some mm -hmm. cases hold considerable distance and we have a a, mod, a society of modernity that to some degree we're we're a bit like grubby kindergartners who can't keep our fingers off of everything. <laughs> we just chew the crayons. <laughs> and the, uh, <clears throat> I think my favorite takeaway meme for from Thanksgiving week. Happy belated Thanksgiving to everyone, by the way. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> uh, pro Thanksgiving tip. If under any circumstances, a toddler offers you something to eat, no matter how delightful it may be, it may appear, do not accept it because it is in fact the flu. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> and in, in, in this regard, uh, the, the, you know, the, the cryptid may be worse than the flu, so. It might just kill you, drive you to madness, which has a very Lovecraftian theme to it. It does. It really the, the the whole story in a way does. <laughs> it makes you wonder if it happened on the legend somewhere. <laughs> and it's you know uh, existing in the water. Yeah, true. Which true. Uh, Lovecraft had a particular sloshing horror about. <laughs> yes. There. Slash, <laughs> <laughs> clack clack slash slash <clears throat> we'll uh uh later 
later in the cage match, the mini Washington will be uh, pitted against the Mari Lloyd. <laughs> after the death match, they will go out for drinks, possibly in your house. So, <laughs> yes, possibly against your will. Uh, <laughs> But the, the aspect of, say, for example, uh, First Nation lore about the little people, yeah. you don't talk about them. True. The lore about skinwalkers, you, you don't touch. talk about them. And you don't talk, you don't touch. You mm -hmm. do everything that you can to avoid. And that is so far removed from our psyche at this point. Well, I think, I mean, let's face it, that's, it's grounded, that's grounded in practicality and common sense. Um, if it, you know, if it might kill you, stay away from it. Um, whereas our, our modern, um, psyche wants to say we we conquer everything and so we are afraid of nothing and yeah. um, so we hurl headlong without looking first <laughs> yes <clears throat> and i i think that that psychologically that pre sometimes precarious ambition leaves us with a lot of unresolved anxiety. Very true. And Very I, true. I would argue I would argue that that anxiety, honestly, it, it is a bit cyclical because the anxiety demands resolve. We attempt to resolve it by trying to figure it out. That's true. <laughs> <clears throat> what a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, it often is. And speaking of unresolved um, uh, occurrences, the White River Monster in yeah. Arkansas, in Jackson County, is interesting, but interesting in very different ways than the, than the Mini Washington. Yes, yes. Uh... <clears throat> and there, there doesn't seem to be much native lore or First Nation people's lore associated with the white monster. Uh, he is referred to as Whitey, which I think is funny, um, beginning in 1915. Well, you know, it's the White River, so let, let's keep it simple. Exactly. And <clears throat> it's, again, it is it's a little difficult to parse out what uh what this creature is if it is that i mean that that's true um i mean it, it's described as you know being grayish as big as a car or bigger um and um uh, sometimes uh, with a horn yes um which does have one similarity with the mini washer too. That's true. That's true. Which, you know, aside from not having fur, which you can't explain, um, you know, there, there's that similarity. Um, one of the sightings, there was a trail of three toed prints um, and some broken trees and, and crushed vegetation along the riverbank. Um, and one of the, see, I think it's the 1930, it was a 1937 sighting. It was pretty detailed. Um, yes. And including a county deputy um, seeing it. And um, I think they described it as the size of a box car or three or four pickup trucks. I mean, so it's big. They were, they, they were seeing something that was big, um, and 
you know, from the scientific point of view, you know, the uh, the candidate that is um, thrown out most often is is a gray elephant seal. Yes. Which are large. I mean, they can weigh up to 7,500 pounds, so as much as a pickup um, or more, and up to 16 feet long. Um, and while, you know, normally they are, you know, hundred, you know, maybe in the Gulf of Mexico, um, they have been known to, I think, go as far north as at least Ohio in the Mississippi. Which, which is a, a wild concept. Not exactly. Yeah. Something yeah. that it's definitely not something that you're just looking for. No. And, and certainly, I mean, certainly that falls, you know, in the crypt as being an animal out of place and certainly could, would explain why people uh, described it the way they did um, if that is the case if it is full grown and, and a very large example um, I mean it would have to be different animals at the different times I mean because it was seen between 1915 and the 70s um, right. <clears throat> but you know it certainly could be multiple specimens going up river at different times whether or not that would account for the missouri river situation i don't know and that is it i mean it is it is an unknown factor <clears throat> there is the the difficult aspect <clears throat> that has to be taken into account which is it could have entirely been made up that's true I mean that 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 is true. Um, something although, that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just say, although uh, with the White River Monster, one one thing that makes me suspect maybe not is you have a deputy going on record, and that could affect his his career. <laughs> and that's a good point. You know, I mean, so. Um, and, and let's face it, that's why a lot of people are hesitant to report things like this or, or um, UFO encounters, et cetera, because it, it could affect their livelihood. And, and certainly I, this, you know, could, if it were made up, particularly if it was a hoax and found out. Yes. And another another one of the uh, witnesses was a large landholder, if I remember right. Okay. And so um, actually owned a plantation in the area, and so it just it seems odd that they that the those people would have a a reason to make it up. It does. And, and there was no attempt to, to cash in on it either. Which is, is an interesting aspect. I think that, you know, realistically in this particular case, unlike the Miniwashatu, which again, as we noted, seems to have a supernatural or non-corporeal mm -hmm. uh, aspect to it. Realistically with uh, the White River Monster, the 7,500 pound elephant seal is pretty reasonable, mm -hmm. albeit out of place. The other is simply the idea of a really, really large catfish. That's true. I mean, that, that, <coughs> that is possible. Um, they've, you know, uh, certainly um, caught a lot of big catfish um in some of the rivers so and although from the descriptions the descriptions sound more like a, the seal than a catfish but it does i i really liked the uh the reference in terms of the sound that the animal made mm -hmm. 
that was a combination of a cow's moo and a horse's neigh, which for uh, folks around <clears throat> Jackson uh, County could be the most adequate way of describing the sound of a large sea mammal. Exactly, exactly. Well, especially one, if you're not familiar with sea mammals and two, certainly not in the White River in Arkansas. Well, I, even today, I don't think that's something that any of us would necessarily be looking for. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, so, and, and typically where you're at at the time something happens, you, you, your mind goes to what could that be here? And so those would be the closest probably that right. you would expect to be in the area. <clears throat> and uh, now the, um, the elephant seal's lifespan tends to be around 15 years. So the uh, sightings over nearly a century in, in Jackson County would forcibly suggest more than one. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that there would be multiple examples, but there, I ha there have been examples of them, I know, like I said, as far north as Ohio. So it's, it's, it's not common, but it's not unknown either to happen, you know, so. Um, yes. And in fact, I think there was one uh, cited uh, in the Mississippi somewhere along Illinois in the last couple of years. So um, I read an article a while back about that. So, um, you know, it's entirely possible. <clears throat> well, and it's, it, it brings up a reality that we oftentimes don't think about, particularly in landlocked areas, but all of the ocean is connected. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, and most of the planet is, is ocean. Yes, and much of it is unexplored. That's right. So um, going up the Mississippi and taking a uh, detour up another river may just be, you know, exploration, you know, or just, you know, should have taken a right turn at Albuquerque, but it's many moment, you know, so. Yeah, it, it, it is not impossible. Something that I do like about uh, a lot of the cryptids that we're talking about today, uh, there's not a lot of association of Oh, it escaped from the zoo. That's true. That's true. Um, so yes, no, no lions, no gorillas, those kind of things. And and I I do like that because um, those are just two pat answers for the number of of uh, things that we're discussing. So, and they are now one of the weirdest cryptids yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that, that we have on the list. I, I actually have a harder time with this one than I do with pale walkers, which we'll get to shortly, is the Oklahoma octopus. And I'm gonna let yeah. you do the intro. I have to step away from the, the camera for just a moment, but okay. I'll let you do the intro, I'll be back in just a second. Okay. And, and again, this is this is one that you know most people will probably be going what the uh, the Oklahoma octopus. Um, it is a cryptid specific with uh, Oklahoma, and generally um, man-made lakes at that. So we're not even talking rivers or where so you know something could have you know swam up from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the reports are that there's an octopus in several different lakes, including, you know, Lake Tinkiller, Ulaga Lake, uh, Lake Thunderbird, et cetera. Um, 
that it's not only there and seen, but that it that it uh, is a predator and attacks and kills swimmers. Although there's no there's no footage of the octopus that's been uh, reported or photos that that can be found. Um, and they, um, again, associate it with a large number of unexplained um, dis uh, drownings and disappearances in the lakes. Yes. Um, <coughs> which, from a logical standpoint, does not help the credibility of the story. <laughs> Because no. you know, just be, you know, we, we have a high a high number of drownings and disappearances, more than statistically we should compared to other lakes. So it must be a monster. Right. Right. <clears throat> that's that's not that's not really how uh, <laughs> how things work. Yep. But you know, and and I I'm not even sure how far back these stories go. Um, I I've not found anything definitive to kind of give an idea of how old the stories are, but they do I, seem to go back at least twenty or thirty years. And I think that's I think that is fair. I. <clears throat> And, and I'm less familiar with these lakes than I am with some of our lakes in Missouri. I know that some yeah. lakes, to put it really bluntly, some lakes are party lakes. Yes, um, and I'm not as familiar with the the named ones as, as some others in in Oklahoma. But yeah, there's there there's well there's a there's a lot of party lakes. There's a lot of um, jet skiing and um, water skiing and, and things like that. So activities that tend to lead to accidents. So um, that that may be the bigger part of it. <laughs> and, I, and I think in this particular case, that is exactly what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and another thing is, uh, cephalopods are not freshwater um, True. where you know the great the elephant seal can navigate freshwater uh, oh, yeah. sharks can etc but there there is there are no known cephalopods in freshwater period that that we know of that we know of <coughs> there was so, an interesting report Uh, not terribly long ago, of a fisherman pulling an octopus out of Lake Conway near Mayflower, Arkansas. And the the common opinion is that somebody had a pet octopus and dropped it in the lake. Yeah. And apparently it survived. Yes, at least long enough to get caught. Get caught. <laughs> of course, it may have been trying to get out at that point. I don't know. <laughs> right. <clears throat> And now, just as a as a point of reality meeting conjecture, the reality side of it being, uh, cephalopods are incredibly intelligent. Yes, they are just absolutely phenomenal in terms of hmm, their intelligence, their survivability, their survival skills, uh, etc. It, it would probably shock a lot of people to know that you know their intelligence is estimated to be roughly equivalent to human intelligence. Yes, and possibly exceeding. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and we can't compress our bodies into tiny spaces, so they okay. they kind of have have some advantages on us. <clears throat> and and so most of us don't squirt eat, so <laughs> operative word most. So, <laughs> in that, in that, uh, in that regard, the idea of a giant cephalopod lurking in freshwater in a freshwater lake where there's a lot of tourists or a lot of lake goers, and man-made. 
Yeah. And uh, easy pickings, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and it's just, it's a, one of those very creepy, unsettling aspects that I think on one hand we dislike, but on the other hand, we're very obsessed with once it gets into our brains. Yes. And, and I'm going to say it just because since, you know, since we started talking about including this, I just wanted to say it, you know, I think some people just want to imagine, you know, there's the Kraken. Yes. You know, uh, attacking their bass boat. <laughs> now I have about six images in my head and uh, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm glad I could do that for you. <laughs> <coughs> <clears throat> I'm I'm anticipating an entirely new display at the aquarium in uh, Springfield. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an impressive aquarium. <laughs> Highly recommend. Uh, five Ooh. out of five stars. So. And occasionally someone does try to go swimming in it. <laughs> oh, just jump right on in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> as as a, a bit of a an interesting but I think important digression on on this is to just jump into the aspect of quote unquote fearsome critters. Mm -hmm which is decidedly an entire section of North American folklore. And it is the section in which the Ozark Howler resides. The Ozark Howler is folklore, not a cryptid. I would personally place fearsome critters and cryptids in two separate categories. Oh, definitely, definitely. But I, I just knew that you were going to make that disclaimer the uh i'm i'm still trying to figure out my ozark howler tattoo please don't <laughs> <clears throat> okay i think that's fair <laughs> i i i really do <clears throat> <laughs> the <clears throat> the the thing that <clears throat> and the thing that i think is important on a serious note in regards to the pearson critters is this is not terribly far removed from the fantastic beasts thank you jk rowling and in essence these are tall tale animals they're jokingly said to inhabit the wilderness in or around, in many cases, logging camps. Fearsome critters are directly associated with the Great Lakes region. And it is part of an understood oral tradition during the turn of the 20th century for both passing the time and for hazing newcomers. Exactly. And it may, it, it, it may be associated with, with the Great Lakes region, but it also found a home in the Ozarks in particular. And I think where, where we see it, certainly as a, as a North American, as a North American tall tale phenomena. Mm -hmm. and, and I think where we particularly see it is, first of all, with working men who are mm -hmm. working in direct association with one another in, in rural or remote America. That's so it is pre industrial, pre urban industrialization to a large degree. The, yeah. the shift in culture that I think took place <clears throat> that made the fearsome critter tall tale phenomena no longer make sense to a modern audience was the urban industrialization that took place during World War II, in which the working men of America, uh, first of all, largely transitioned away from 
uh, rural settings into urban factory settings. And you're not going to be making up uh, wild critters in the dark in downtown Detroit or Philly or you know the or Portland or wherever you're working on B-17s, et cetera. Well, and you're not you're not spending hours together after work passing time. Yes. Uh, and then that, also this is followed with mass communication and TV, et cetera, rapidly. So that yes. instead of entertaining ourselves, we were being entertained. <clears throat> and as America began to become dramatically more affluent as a superpower, we saw it as, you know, just going off of what you already noted, after the, the men were done working, and women were done working. Uh, they were not congregating in camps at night afterwards. They were going home to their hermetically sealed suburban boxes yeah. uh, and watching TV, listening to the radio, and being a, living a very different life than mm -hmm. working men in particular had lived 50 years prior. Very true. Maybe we should throw out a couple of examples of fearsome creatures that uh, critters that ended up being more unique to the uh, Ozarks. Oh, <clears throat> which one would you like to start with? Mm. Well, I don't know. Um, mm, how about the Galrao? Oh. <clears throat> the Gao Rao is, is fun. Um, the Gao Rao is essentially a dinosaur with giant baleful eyes that lives in caves. Uh, it is named the Gao Rao because that's the sound that it makes uh, deep in its fictional and imaginary throat. <clears throat> and it has, it, ha it has all of the hallmarks of a fearsome critter. It is large it is mysterious it exists out of place it uh, has giant candle-like shining eyes and it can bite metal in half yes and presumably pulling one in that is dangling a, a rope right uh, you know don't 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 hang out at the cave entrance it might come and get you exactly <coughs> and you know, speaking of logging camps, I would be interested, just as a, a socio-anthropological standpoint, how many of our tall tales didn't start with the Ozarks logging camps, of which there were hundreds, if not thousands, prior mm -hmm. to about 1950. It's into, you know, I, I imagine some did. I mean, uh, and certainly uh, some of the early bring the news back to town, basically. Yeah, and <clears throat> there's, you know, I think it not associated with the Ozarks, but probably the most well-known critter of this category is the jackalope. Yeah, um, probably the best known to contemporary uh, ears and eyes. Uh, mainly because you see you, you see them in souvenir shops. Yes, uh, quite often. Um, <clears throat> the drugstore in the town in which I grew up had a jackalope mounted on the wall. <laughs> yes. I was always, always quite fascinated. Um, I was <clears throat> always like to go into Gilliman's Drug because one. I'd occasionally get macadamia nuts, and two, I would get to see the jackalope. The, there you uh, go. <laughs> I, I am of particular interest in the fur-bearing trout. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
<laughs> and the which, which, great... I, which may just be a goldfish with ick. I'm not sure, but <laughs> it might be. Uh, I did see a picture though. He has a quite a lush uh, coat. <laughs> Um, uh, the, <laughs> the gilly-galoo bird is a bird that lays square eggs so they do not roll down the hill. <laughs> and uh, the goofus bird is a backwards flying bird that builds its nest upside down. I think I've met him. <laughs> <clears throat> I possibly may have interviewed him. The, <laughs> uh, and from the Pacific Northwest comes the Splinter Cat. It is a legendary cat, cat that uses its incredible speed and stiff forehead to smash into large trees, knocking the branches off and withering the trunks. Ouch. Yes. <laughs> Which actually does kind of bring us to another one of our creatures in the Ozarks. Yes, where it gets us a little closer to your favorite urban legend, it but does. Um, the wampus cat. I like the wampus cat, and I do too. <clears throat> what I particularly what I, I have a personal reason for liking the wampus cat, and that is that my grandpa, on a regular basis, would ask me if I had seen a wampus cat. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, alas i had not <laughs> but the the association the 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 wampus cat's great grandson is certainly the ozark howler yes yes but the the wampus cat in reality was probably uh mountain lion yeah bobcats uh large cats um and they were known throughout the Ozarks in the early days. Um, and we won't go into the color of their fur. Um, <laughs> we just <laughs> will leave that to people's imaginations and arguments uh, later. <laughs> I think that's fair. Um, and, um, and, and we mentioned Crowley's Ridge earlier, but one of the noted accounts about the early settling of Crowley's Ridge, um, which is uh, in the eastern uh, Ozarks. It, it starts just north of the Missouri line, goes down into uh, Arkansas, um, is that it was known to be the habitat of wampus cats um, in the early 1800s. Yes. And it was considered a very dangerous area because of that. Um, and it also has led to, I think, a lot of other legends that are related to spirits of women and things like that, because the 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 yowls and, and cries are often um, uh, compared to the sound of a screaming woman. And <clears throat> first of all, I think culturally and folklorically that connection is important. Second of all, the fact that we are dealing, whether we're dealing with, regardless of the color associated with the cougar, the, the panther that we're, we're talking about, mm -hmm. we're dealing with a large apex predator that hunts nocturnally. That's right, and uh, and the, the, there were the and this was not just something new with with settlers come with European settlers coming in. Um, the um, embodiment of of this exists in native lore, particularly the Cherokee as well. Yes, and that I think is <clears throat> one of the most telling certainly an aspect that that separates the wampus cat a bit from say like a jackalope mm -hmm. well and that's the thing is that um 
it's it's basically another name for a creature that we know exists, um, although it's not very common anymore in this region. Although right. sightings are actually on the rise. Um, and whether or not conservation folks agree with it. A fair. <clears throat> very, very fair. And <clears throat> in particular, the Cherokee legends and their, their association with female spirits, with witch magic, uh, these types of things, doing some crossover in terms of witch cats, which have uh, a strong Scots-Irish association attached. There's a lot of very interesting bits of lore that are associated with wampus cats but then from a scientific standpoint simply the reality of large panthers um, specifically uh, apex predator cougars living and breeding within the, the the traditional ozarks range is is a simple reality it it is um and you know uh one that you know ranchers don't have to deal with too often these days but um uh, in fact the crowley's ridge um settlers uh crowley and his family his favorite horse was attacked by a wampus cat right and and mutilated to the point that they had to put the horse down yeah and <clears throat> horses and cougars do not get along no that's <clears throat> that is just a, a simple reality one um thing to make sure that we <clears throat> have time to cover because we have a lot of material but mm -hmm. have time to cover let's uh let's jump over to uh pale walkers and reptilians okay um and pale walkers are, are very interesting to me. Um, um, it's something that doesn't get talked about as much. I think it's becoming a little more uh, known, at least in cryptid field, but um, it actually goes back quite a, quite a long ways. Um, sort of the the rock stars of, of this sort of genre right now are skinwalkers and wendigo, but um, pale walkers are very tall, very thin looking uh, creatures, a sort of a, a humanoid shape. Uh, usually in a, you know, a swaying motion or walking, uh, but not in a human gait. Um, and have quite, they, they have quite an effect on, on witnesses, not necessarily uh, making them ill, that kind of thing, but certainly um, a, a fearful reaction, um, fear of, um, doom, panic, um, and um, often animals will, if, if animals are around, they, they will uh, cower, whimper, uh, be submissive, um, so indicating that this is a predator. Yes. <clears throat> and, and there's just the, the sense that <clears throat> there's a wrongness about the space. Yes. Um, you know, um, from accounts that I've heard, it's almost like associating it with sort of accounts of aliens um, that, that, you know, you've heard, but it's not uh because it's hair they're hairless they're they're long-limbed uh, out of proportion and so kind of get that 
similarity to some of the descriptions of gray aliens, but that something is just not right at all about it. Um, but that's sort of the closest description that that comes to mind. Um, and it's, <clears throat> mm, this is probably, <clears throat> this and reptilians are the two most furthest removed from the animal out of place. True, yeah, this is, this is not something that's known anywhere or that you, that really makes sense from any um, zoological explanation. Um, um, it just it it does just doesn't look like it should belong in this world, but seems to be biological, or or at least corporeal. At least corporeal, yes. That's <clears throat> that's the better way to put it. Or, or at least corporeal part of the time, which is yeah. bringing us into something that uh, Native American lore deals with quite readily, mm -hmm. but that, that Western lore really struggles with, which is the possibility that sometimes something can be physical and then later it can be not physical. Right. And... Um... And often these the, these encounters are in places that um, you would not expect to encounter something. Now you're not in the not necessarily in the middle of the forest or a river or whatever, um, but the but they show up in places that are very normal. Yes. <coughs> now. One of the accounts that I've heard, it's not in the notes, <clears throat> but was a report that was very similar to this after uh, a, a couple of individuals had been rather giddily hard at work conjuring portals for the fun of it, but not knowing how to close them. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> um, I, I and I and I and I'm not you know I, I know there are there are some that want to say that that they that is a dimensional being or something through the veil I mean I, I don't know I, I I know accounts that I've heard um, are just happening on upon it and uh, just eliciting terror um, yes. Yes. And um, making a making a very deep impression on witnesses. Um, yes. <clears throat> and tying and I know at least one of these accounts is in the Ozarks. Have you have you heard of other accounts within the Ozarks region? Um, I I have I have, but not in detail. Um, yes. I I have. And, and I've actually spoken with um, a cryptozoologist um, a while back who said that he had gotten several reports from the Ozarks of pale walkers that they were looking into, but they didn't have a lot of details at that point, um, but that they, they had received reports through out the country. So it, it's not an isolated uh, occurrence, but it does, it does happen here. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> unlike, as you already noted, unlike <clears throat> uh, skinwalkers and windigos, pale walkers are not getting a lot of attention, comparatively speaking, on the internet. There's not a lot of details about them. <clears throat> what I th do think is very interesting, though, is that the comparatively scant details about pale walkers lines up with a number of these reports that we've had personally. Yes, th they do. They do. Um, in some of the reports, they, you know, they, they are bipedal, they're walking, others that describe them as, as um 
crawling. Um, now there, there is sort of an infamous photo um, of something along those lines that is sort of crawling and it, it actually is supposed to, you know, quote, supposed to have been taken, not actually, uh, not too far from the Joplin area. Um, and it's, it's made its way around the internet for years and has been proven a number of times to have been manipulated. Yes. Um, it's still a creepy image. It is. It, it is. Um, but I think that kind of is where a lot of, quote, the crawling version comes from. Um, I think more of the firsthand experiences and the native lore tend to describe this more as, um, you know, bipedal. Yes. And with a, with a, with a <clears throat> hypnotic and unnatural swaying motion. Yes. Um, and often uh, uh, limbs that are unnat unnaturally proportioned, arms that are too long to be human, um, or uh, the, the joints not being proportioned like a normal human being yes it does seem to be exclusively seen at night pretty much i i'm not aware of any uh encounters during the day and it does seem to have a strong association <clears throat> in some cases with native american lore it it does in 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 some cases but that there are encounters with people who are not a of Native American ancestry, so. <clears throat> and the reports that we have include uh, British Columbia, they include Missouri, they include Illinois, they include upstate New York. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, <clears throat> it doesn't seem to be associated with a particular region. No, no, um, I, I don't think it's isolated by any means. and. In some ways, that gives it a more credibility uh, as being something that could be out there, not just um, one creature that may have some sort of mutation or something. And to me, what's particularly interesting, <clears throat> if I was just browsing the internet, I would put this in the same category as Slenderman except for the fact that we have actual reports and firsthand experiences. And, and I can tell you the firsthand experiences um, that I know of predate the internet reports. Yes. So what it is, is up for grabs. We really don't know, but we know it but, is up. But, but, but if if uh, if if uh, Native American um, lore on these creatures is is taken seriously, if you see one, I would run. <laughs> yes, they that that is one thing that is very consistent. Yeah, that they are dangerous, um, and potentially uh, malevolent. So yes. So bear that in mind. That's our warning to you. If you encounter a pale walker, don't go try to make friends with it. Just exit the area <laughs> expeditiously. Yeah, but post case. <laughs> from what we can from what we can tell, exiting the area is usually not a problem for the people who encounter them. No, no, they they don't seem to be very fast or um you know chasing um but apparently there are instances in the lore that you know they they can be dangerous so no yes. use risking it <clears throat> and now no. probably for the weirdest and and <laughs> very specifically <clears throat> directly associated with one of our favorite towns in the Ozarks. 
of course. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> reptilians in caves underneath Carthage, Missouri. Yes, and you know this is this is one of those that I you know um, it comes from two thousand and four, and you really have to. I I I don't know the individuals who reported this personally. I don't know whether this was after a night of partying or this, this really is. happened. But I mean, with with pale walkers out there, I, I can't discount it uh, entirely. It's very detailed. It it is, and that that's um, details are good. Sometimes too many details do make you wonder if someone was writing fan fiction. But um, basically what they describe is, and it's not just underground caves, but um, it's a very large underground storage facility that really goes for miles. And so just for, for clarification, <coughs> the, the underground being the public and private storage facility near Carthage, this place, we, you, you can confirm this place exists. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, um, it, it, it is storage for, uh, including cold storage um, for a number of large companies. Um, uh, you have semi trucks in and out all the time. Um, there is a racquetball court in there, um, but tunnels go back a long ways, and some of them are not used. Some of them are unfinished, and if you go to a certain uh, go back far enough, it at, you actually opens onto. Um, one of the one of the underground rivers um and so uh the report is a couple of people have been um out atv riding and um had gotten back in there and um end up having an experience um, they say, and there, there are markings uh, through the tunnels and so forth for directions, because to be honest, you probably could get lost. Um, uh, probably not so much now with, with some of the GPS systems, but, um, and, and, and all of this is true. And anyone that's been in there would be able to, you know, knows that. Um, but they get to a point where, um, you know, that it's basically uh, a restricted area, I think military, if I remember right, and um, which <coughs> is not, not out of the realm of possibility um, with because of other things. So um, I can't confirm that area, but I, I can't say that it's impossible by any means. Yes. And so, you know, basically they start, um, see the road dips, takes a 90, <coughs> 90 degree turn. Um, they say they were going to, uh, Fast. They thought they were going to hit a wall. Instead, they passed through it, almost like it's a projection or a hologram. Uh, maybe Wiley e. Coyote's tunnel paintings. Um, <laughs> and that now they are in a completely different tunnel or road system, um, which they say now is even older than where they had been, which that part doesn't make sense to me, but per se, but um, they, 
notice damp odors, uh, getting stronger, um, lighting's changed, um, not as much light, they turn on their headlights. Um, again, they go around another turn and they um, come up in an area they say they thought was a rest area. Um, they say that they uh, saw something, uh, uh, fountains, and that objects moved. Um, and then they see two creatures. One was very tall, I think seven feet, maybe more, powerfully built and reddish in color. The other was smaller, about six feet tall, and it was pale, almost albino color not as powerfully built as the other one, um, resembling large reptiles. Um, they didn't see anything, but they sensed a malevolent feeling uh, or presence, um, particularly from the taller one. Um, they scream, they turn around, they start back, and the taller one was following them, um, uh, they feared that, you know, it was going to hurt them. They um, may get back through the projection, uh, back to the regular part of the underground. And um, they see the, the tall one raise its arm, holding some sort of weapon, and um, it fires, hits one of the ATVs, which, uh, and killed the engine. And call, yep. causing it to stall. Um, the rider uh, jumped on the other ATV and they drove away. Um, and um, I guess the tall reptilian was now in the sort of on this side of the projection area, um, but had not crossed all the way in. Um, that in part is where I start going, eh, maybe we're fan fiction. <laughs> Which is fair. Um, they slow down. Um, uh, and they have a stare down. Yes. And then leave. Which again, all of this is beginning to sound too much like a movie. Right. Um, so... Your thoughts. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> well, you're more familiar with Carthage than I am. Um, mm -hmm. oh, now, what we do know, <clears throat> we know that the underground is real. The underground is real. Uh, law, and, 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 and lots of traffic goes in and out. I mean. Mm -hmm. and, and we also we also know that there is a fast cave network beneath Carthage. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I, in, in, in people being able to get in there and get lost, that's definitely a possibility. Yes. Um, the likelihood of reptilians living underneath Carthage, as fascinating and delightful as that is, because I like the idea. I do first, too. I'll be the first to admit I like the idea. I think the likelihood of it is comparatively quite low. You know, maybe a skink, you know, uh, but seven foot reptilian, I rather doubt. <clears throat> now, what I do think is fascinating is the comparatively recent urban lore or urban legend surrounding even the idea of reptilians. Well, True, but actually, there, 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 there's urban legends of reptilians living under LA that go back mid century. Yes. Which uh, has always fascinated me too, but me as well. <laughs> and before we, we dismiss it out of kind, I think that it's important to take into consideration that. Um, reptiles and reptile human hybrid supernatural beings etc 
are a part of our ancient lore. That's true. Um, uh, th this is not a motif that you can say is the internet age or even just, or even a 1950s B movie. It, go, it does go back to <laughs> uh, <Right>. ancient times. <clears throat> it does. And <clears throat> while I, again, think that the, the likelihood that we have a very own reptilians here in the Ozarks is sadly unlikely. I'm not ready to utterly dismiss it, but more than that, I think it just is important in terms of a mm, religious iconography and what that potentially means as a, as a way of viewing society, as a way of viewing perspectives, uh, larger cosmological questions, these types of things. I just find it fascinating. And I'm excited that whether, whether it was an actual account, or whether it was a bit of fan fiction gone serious, whether it is, regardless of where this particular story, how this story originated, uh, all the way down to the uh, uh, lengthy registration number on the ATV, I think we should type that in and see where we, what it brings us up. But <laughs> the um, it's it's the but all of that speaks to something that to me is a larger um, anthropological or sociological reality, and perhaps the reason the whole uh, conspiracy theory urban legend of reptilians really took off. In, in public consciousness is because it does speak to those deeper mythological archetypes. Well, I, I, I think you're right. And in particular, this particular story has a lot of similarities with other underground highway stories. Um, that connect Carthage to Springfield to Kansas City um, for movement for you know government vehicles and this and that. Uh, if the accounts are believed, uh, it's you know related to you know stories about things that whatever's happening under the Denver airport in Colorado. Um, and I think one commonality is. Uh, it is it, it is a primal fear that I think was accentuated in the Cold War. The these yes. the, the idea of hidden highways, hidden spaces that are analogous to bunkers and so forth, is very much part of the Cold War era psyche and it fear, is. and something lurking in those those hidden spaces, um, I think just goes along with the, the anxiety brought about by the Cold War, uh, digging up those primal fears. And I think reptiles just kind of fit, you know, they, they fit that bill. And <laughs> the fact that you have things like that here ver and LA both kind of, I think, suggest that. It does, <clears throat> and and possibly the, there's some really interesting <clears throat> analogies to be drawn from that because, of course, the thing that on a primeval level and just on a on a very mm, primal level of survival, the thing that's frightening about reptiles, snakes specifically, mm -hmm. um, they can be very dangerous because of their venom. I realize full disclaimer: only a couple of a uh, handful of snake species in the Ozarks are venomous and all the rest of them aren't. Learn your snake mm -hmm. species. There you go. There's a disclaimer on that. Mm -hmm. But the possibility of something deadly hiding in the grass. Mm -hmm. and, or the dark. <laughs> and that's the, that's the next part. The, <clears throat> the, uh, the underground, um, underground world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The idea that uh, 
that the, the reptiles have gone from hiding in the grass to hiding beneath the shopping mall, hiding beneath city hall, hiding beneath um, the, the uh, trucking facility, hiding beneath regular modern industri industrial life. And can come, come and go as they wish. Yes. And, and associated with that is <clears throat> a lot of the, the archetypal motifs of the reptile. It's um, mm, transcendence, it's long life, it's a uh, high degree of uh, trickster wisdom, it's danger because of its intelligence and its willingness to wait out its prey, these types of things. These uh, attributes, these archetypal attributes that are deep-seated in the human psyche, they all are associated with these stories. That's true. That's true. And um, that being said, from the scientific standpoint, I'm at a loss. No. <laughs> yeah. The, I can't the, make the argument right now. <laughs> the, no, we're we're <clears throat> we're unavailable for comment from the scientific standpoint. What we can tell you from a scientific standpoint is that normal reptiles are real. Sometimes they're very large, sometimes out of place. We can tell you that um, places like the underground, both in Springfield and in Carthage, and possibly in other locations that these are real locations and they are cavernous, impressive, and they do go underground for a long way. That's true, but unless someone, you know, uh, uh, somehow brought in a Komodo dragon and it, and it uh, uh, tripled in size and learned to be bipedal, this probably is not empirical. Probably not, uh, but that's okay. It's I, I, for one, am thrilled that we have our own reptilian underground story in direct association with the Ozarks and not just generally the Ozarks, but quite specifically Carthage. Yeah, and I can, I can just, I can drive you to the entrance next time you're down, so. Fantastic. If they have, uh, you know, selection of cheeses on cold storage, I'm in. <laughs> okay. And, you know, that, uh, that might be a good place to to wind up here. Now, don't forget to check out upcoming events and merchandise at darkozarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. Thanks again to Always Buying Books and Beard Engine Brewing Company for helping bring the Dark Ozarts to everyone. And on the next episode, we're going to be again going back to discussing dark winter ghost stories and more. Catch the Dark Ozarts podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and other podcast platforms. Thank you, everyone. And remember, there are no easy answers in the Dark Ozarks.